Hello, welcome to the Thursday, February 15th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. And well, you probably guessed it that Meltdown and Spectre weren't the end of all CPU exploits. Speculative execution and executing instructions out of order certainly opens some gaps here that would allow an attacker to gain insight on other processes running on the same processor to better understand and possibly exploit this fundamental issue with modern processor. Researchers at Princeton came up with a tool for automatically synthesizing microarchitecture specific programs. Now, what this really means is that they're able to very quickly test various attack patterns against common x86 architectures. And with that, of course, they're essentially sort of fuzzing a microcode, which of course makes it a lot simpler and faster to come up with new possible vulnerabilities. Now they found two variations of the Spectre and Meltdown attack that they are calling Spectre Prime and Meltdown Prime. The name Prime actually goes back, if you dig in the literature, to 2006. That's as far back as researchers have discussed these issues with caches and how they can possibly be used to retrieve data left by other processes. The Prime and Probe attack that was discussed in this 2006 paper essentially refers to first filling the cache with attacker known data then let whatever other program runs run and then probe or check which attacker probed data is still in the cache and then use that to fill in well whatever gaps were left. Now, on a good note, the paper does point out that it looks like software fixes that have so far been published for Spectre will protect you from Spectre Prime, but hardware fixes may have to look a little bit uh, different. The problem with Spectre Prime is that it really sort of exploits how two cores in a CPU are accessing each other's cache. So uh, we'll have to see how that'll affect any hardware fixes that will hopefully come up in future processors. And I hope that whoever is working on these future processors will take a look at this tool to hopefully root out some additional bugs. And I talked earlier this week about the Olympic destroyer, the malware that apparently attacked systems at the Winter Olympics. One of the missing pieces here was how did the malware actually get onto these systems? Well, it looks like we have an answer to that. Now it appears that Atos, a company that is supporting the IT operations at the Winter Olympics, apparently was hacked a couple of months ago. Some of this analysis is based on a sample of the malware being submitted to VirusTotal back in December. So the evidence right now is somewhat circumstantial, but certainly it makes sense that a major IT vendor like this who is supporting the networks would be a very interesting target for anybody trying to disrupt systems at the Olympics. Now, and we all know that TLS remains to be a moving target when it comes to what a proper current configuration should look like. The next version of TLS, TLS version 1.3, is supposed to not only help us with establishing TLS connections faster, but also it's supposed to fix a number of security issues that have come up in prior versions. The problem has so far been, well, uh, that the TLS 1.3 standard has been a moving target as well in that there were a number of issues with actually getting TLS 1.3 to work reliably, in particular with proxies, for example. 
So rollout has been somewhat slow. Well, OpenSL now released the first OpenSL library that does support TLS 1.3. That's OpenSL 1.1.1 pre-release one. As the suffix here, pre-release one should tell you, this is not production ready code yet, but if you want to test how well it works or doesn't work with your own applications, you may want to take a look at this early release. And while well, exploiting default passwords in DVRs, firewalls and the like has been the thing to do the last couple of years, there is a new sort of interesting variety of this kind of malware out that New Sky Security calls the double door bot. Where it differs itself is that it really only focuses on two very specific systems. The first one is Juniper's screen OS uh, with the good old backdoor we had back in 2015. Secondly, it's looking at psych cell modems and the backdoor that was found in these modems late in 2016. So not really bleeding edge exploits here, but uh, exploits that haven't really been seen too much. And the architecture it's sort of looking for is in particular net screen firewalls in front of these psych cell modems. Other than that, uh, this particular bot that doesn't seem to be all that specific, the little test string that we often see in uh, these bots uh, that sort of appended to the busybox command. Remember, that sort of gave, gave Mirai its name. Uh, this particular piece of malware randomizes it. Not really sure if that makes any real difference in this case. I see it more as a curiosity at this point, not really as a major new threat. If you still have an unpatched net screen firewall out connected to on your network and exposed to the internet, it probably already has gotten compromised by something else. Well, and this is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.